Wigger Outdoors World, welcome uh, to this episode of our podcast, vlogcast, or whatever else you want to call it. And today I'm delighted to introduce three times world champion, four times Paralympic sailor, Hannah Stodel to the, to the podcast. Um, Hannah, we're honoured. Thank you for joining us. No worries. Thank you for having me. That's just cool. Um, if, if people should know anything about you, what else should they know? Oh, random fun fact. Um, so I've only got one arm, but I have got three kidneys. So. <laughs> one arm, three kidneys. Yeah. Well, that means if ever you're short of cash, you can go to Eastern Europe or South America and make some money. <laughs> it has been mentioned before, actually, that I should sell one kidney. <laughs> I mean, you've still got one as a spare. Exactly. Yeah. You know, backup kidney. <laughs> backup kidney. <laughs> So, um, Hannah, we're truly honest, honoured to have you today um, and, and for me to be able to talk to you about all things sailing, the outdoors, Olympics, and ultimately um, the pursuit of being uh, the first, well, I don't know, what's the Von D mean? There's a series of firsts, the Von D around the world globe next year. There's a whole lot of firsts involved in that. What are the firsts? <laughs> Um, so basically the Vendee Globe is a around the world race um, in 60 foot boats that's never been attempted by a disabled person so you know that's that's the long-term goal aim um, I'm actually aiming for the 2024 20, edition of the race um, mm. but we'll see there's a lot of there's a lot of record breaking to do in the meantime with the uh, with disability sailing and things to raise the profile that it's possible yeah that's incredible and so how did you get into sailing or why did you choose sailing i mean you could do anything from football to i don't know bungee jumping why sailing i was rubbish at literally every other sport that was terrible <laughs> sailing i don't know sailing for me was just like it just clicked like it's a family it's a family sport like both my parents are really strong sailors and yeah i was just thrown in a boat as a child like three years old with my sandwich and my mum used to race with me sort of you know present in the boat <laughs> and then yeah it kind of stuck from from there and I was always on the water and I loved it and it's addictive and I've been doing it ever since <laughs> that's in okay cool so you're fo like following the family footsteps almost yeah like my mum almost made the olympics like she never like she never talked about it or anything because like you know she just missed out like by it was some silly number of points and just was so close to making it to korea for seoul in the 88 olympics and just yeah so definitely a wow. family thing <laughs> well that's cool because um i I've, I've met quite a lot of people who've competed at a high level in different sports and often you know the the sort of teenagers end up dragging the parents around and the parents don't have that much interest um like they they do because obviously it's the child you love but in terms of the sport they're like oh your parents you must have not been able to keep them away from the water oh no it's the actual opposite like my mum uh, she's very mummager so like she's like behind the scenes the logistics and everything like that but when it came to actually watching the racing, she couldn't do it because she'd get so angry. She'd be like shouting at the water and stuff, like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And like, just have to leave because she was so angry. <laughs> but yeah, my mum never watches me actually race because she gets like proper into it. Like even now when I'm offshore, she'll be up at like two o'clock in the morning, like tracker stalking to see where we are and like, why have you made that decision that it's completely wrong? Like. <laughs> we had to take the phone number of the boat away from her because like she can't be in touch with the boat because she's just too <laughs> too stressful so she can only phone the office and she can't phone the boat <laughs> that's crazy and your dad is he mr chilled or is he just the same yeah <laughs> no, uh, he's pretty chilled like he definitely uh he's just like a proper strategist when it comes to sailing and like the tactics so he gets really into it and like he tracker stalks, but he, he keeps his opinions a bit more to himself. <laughs> That's epic. So how do you go from family hobby to four times Paralympian? Like, how do you, tr or, or even just to the point of being taken seriously as a competitor? Um, I think, like, we're really lucky with the UK that we have the, the Royal Yachting Association sort of running everything. And they had an amazing youth and junior squad system. So 
once you started racing the right boats and you got picked up and you got squad a lot of doors started opening for me and that you know I fitted into the squad system I started getting results and then the pathway was kind of it's mapped out for you you know you start in East Virginia and you your ultimate aim is the Olympics and that's just what it is and then if you make it you make it kind of thing so that's cool and um so you were, must have been when you were a kid racing with other able against other able-bodied kids and so first of all how was that but also how did you overcome the obvious barriers of people's naivety around the capabilities of somebody who is i suppose i could say you're missing like the, the bottom half of your lower arm right that's what's not there yeah um, so, so first of all, how was it racing against all those able-bodied kids? Like, were you kicking their asses or? Like, it sounds really weird, but like, I've never even thought of myself as disabled. And like, I've got video footage of me from like back in the day, like when I was 13 and stuff. And I, I state like right there and then that my aim was the Olympics. Like I never had even considered disability sport. It wasn't even a thing for me. And, and to be honest, I... I didn't want to do that side of the sport because I just, I was like, well, I can do the Olympic stuff. I can do the able-bodied stuff and I can compete and race with these guys. So why, why do I want to go and sail with these old guys with these bits missing when actually I'm just as good as these kids? So yeah, I never, I never even considered disability sport. And then, yeah, I just, I was charging <laughs> straight, straight ahead for the Olympics. And what about the back? Did you have barriers that you had to overcome, or like convincing? Um, I, I, I've just I've worked in and around the outdoor like adventure sports world for a long time, and I can just imagine sort of a I don't know a, a head instruct RYA instructor or something like that who gets very nervous about the idea of the 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 girl who can go quick but but is missing a bit of an arm uh, sending her out on the water on her own is is they get a bit panicky about stuff like that. Yeah, it's really, like, it's really funny. Like, I, it wasn't so much, like, in the early years, like, it wasn't really noticed. But then the more into it I got and the further along and the older I got, the more it started to become an issue, which is, like, it's actually crazy because I was probably more of a health hazard when I was younger and racing than I was when I was older. I actually knew what I was doing. So, yeah, it's sort of, like, through my teenagers, it definitely became an issue. Um, I had, like, one performance manager who, like, we'd go in for our review meetings to see, like, whether you're on the right path, whether you're in the right boat, whether you're sailing with the right person. And he was like, you're in the wrong sport. <laughs> no he's way! Like, yeah, he's like, straight out, your sailing's not your sport, you shouldn't be doing it. Actually, you should consider something else. Have you tried table tennis? And I'm like, what? <laughs> like no <laughs> te te no I'm sorry to anyone that likes table tennis but just no <laughs> so no <laughs> so yeah he he straight up was like no you can't and uh, yeah that was a pretty a pretty tough meeting to be told that it's not your sport and it's something you enjoy and love and want to do <laughs> and you've got this guy like oh no it's not your sport <laughs> Does that, you, you know, when I learned to kayak, I was quite young and um, I learned in a swimming pool and I was about eight years old and maybe nine years old. And the guy who was the instructor delivering the introduction program, but just before the start of a session, um, he did an Eskimo roll and we were all like, oh, wow. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're, you're, you're second to God <laughs> in our world at this point in time. And, um, <laughs> And then we, so we said, well, what, what was that? He's like, oh, that's an Eskimo roll. And like, we're like, teach us. He said, oh, no, no, no. Only the really good people to do that. It's unlikely you'll ever be good enough. And I still reflect back to what was the motivation in my childhood to like push forwards with kayaking? And it was probably to prove that guy wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah. Did, did you get that same, same sensation from the performance manager? I got it and I got it better. So, um, Right. recently I've started doing um, some speaking about my, my journey and, and things I've learned and I actually went to give a talk at a university and he was there <laughs> he turned oh. up to my talk <laughs> and one of my stories is being told that you can't do something <laughs> and this guy's sitting right there in the audience and I'm just like oh my god am I gonna have to change my talk and then I'm like you know what no actually and I went for it I just was like 
brutally honest, as I tend to be. And yeah, he was sat right there. So, <laughs> did he come up to you afterwards? He did actually. He came up and he um, was like, "You've done really well for yourself." And I was like, oh, "Thanks very much." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you didn't feel I'd, I, uh, I, you'd be struggling to put my fingers up towards him. Um, very, very rude gestures. I think calling him out in front of a thousand people probably did the job. <laughs> well, at least, at least you didn't go and put his name on a slide and like directly point at him. Like, here's his name and he sat just there. <laughs> yeah, you can beat him up after the talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's incredible. And so then, what, what, what ha- uh, I've lost my words, but so you were set on the Olympics, but then obviously somebody gave you the opportunity to take uh, take sailing to the next level, but also to step into the Paralympic sort of world. How did like d- did that hurt your head? Because you were set on you were set on full Olympics when you were younger. What, what happened there? So I got a phone call from Andy Castles, who was the Atlanta gold medalist, and he was training for Sydney. And he basically just said, look, I've heard that you're the sailor, you're disabled. I'm training for Sydney. I'd like you to come and hang out with us for a weekend and kind of see what we're all about. Um, I remember throwing the mother of all tantrums. I'm like 15 years old at this point. I'm into the youth squad. I'm you know, I'm proper cool. I've got my team jacket. I'm, you know, I'm team GB for the able body stuff. And I've got this dude ringing me, telling me I've got to go and hang out with them for a weekend to look at some dis- disabled sailing. And I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> but I got, I got persuaded by my parents. Um, I think some bribery may have occurred. And my dad actually had to come with me to the, the weekend training and ended up sailing, which is <laughs> bonkers. But yeah, it got me on the water and that, like that weekend it kind of changed it changed everything for me like my viewpoint was changed Andy is such a legend of a guy like he he has the same attitude that I have which is like it's not it's not about the disability it's not it's about just going sailing and let's just go sailing and race and yeah he showed me that that's what it was about and that it wasn't a weaker a weaker side of our sport it was just the same just done mm. by disabled people so yeah it was a real eye-opener for me what was there a tipping point in that weekend where you were like you had like because i can imagine you sort of arriving a bit like my parents have bribed me to be here i'll kind of suffer it for the weekend and next week i'll go back to being a junior gb person and <laughs> and I, we'll, we'll, we'll put this behind us what was there a tipping point yeah, we, um, so basically I was racing against Andy in his like tuning boat, his sparring boat. So, and he like handed it to us on a platter. Like, <laughs> like, and my dad was in the boat with me and my dad's a good racer and he's strong and like, we're fiery. And this guy was just handing it to us time and time again. And I think I was just like, this is not on. <laughs> like, I don't like being beaten. So what is happening here? Like, we need to do something. And just, like over and over again being beaten and realizing that Andy's a pretty epic sailor here and actually that it's not about the disability and it's like right okay then <laughs> game <Yeah>. on Andy <laughs> well I guess the difference between like para- in terms of speed and whatever else the difference between Paralympic and Olympic can't be that much it's nothing it's the same race course it's the same boats it's just it's just done by disabled people that's the bizarre thing about it it's the, it's a genuinely inclusive sport which is you know one of the coolest things i guess yeah and, and the times uh, roughly you're doing the same times as the uh, as the Olymp- Olymp- like or whatever you want to call them the others <laughs> the others i like that <laughs> yeah it, it's it's crazy because like for every regatta through the season the olympic and paralympic classes race the same events at the same time it's just literally the olympics and the paralympics where we get separated so it's kind of yeah it's bonkers really because you're like well i spend all year racing with these guys and then we just for the games it's that one week where you've got to be olympic and paralympic as separate events so nuts and what what do you have to do to like adapt the boat or adapt yourself or whatever to um uh, well uh, to state the obvious to to compensate from for 
being minus a hand? I mean, is what, what do you have to do? Uh, so I actually didn't use any adaptations at all. Like the the sonar keelboat was the boat that I ended up sailing. Mm. is is an able-bodied boat. It's mm. it's sailed by able-bodied guys all over the world. And yeah, I didn't have any adaptations. I didn't need anything. And the the two guys that I sailed with barely needed anything. You know, we had one um, bar that went across the boat, which was for Steve if he needed it. But like I probably saw him use it once or twice, like my whole career. And John had a, a transfer bench, which he literally slid from side to side. And that was, that was everything. And it, it was quite cool because it meant we could go up against the able body guys with our boats and just be like, yeah, cool, bring it. <laughs> let's, let's have a race. And it was, it was quite cool to be in that position to not need to adapt it to be on the same level. Yeah, because I think that's people's like version of adaptive sport is like there's all sorts of fancy prosthetic -y, gimmicky things all over the place and uh actually there's there's very little need for it as long as we think can think well enough yeah exactly and it's like it's a total bugbear of mine like when you go to some disabled events and they're like oh bless your heart you can't be you can't do this you can't do this and you're like well, why didn't you ask me and like if I can do this before you, you judge and oh my god you're an amputee so how could you possibly and you're like just just watch just like, just just yeah this is one of my total like frustrations with disability sport in general you turn up and they're like oh my god you can't do this and you're like ah, wait you don't know me <laughs> I, I think there's a there's like a thing where um you get a certain sort of coach or instructor that wants to coach or instruct adaptive sport. Let's be honest about it. There, it does. It does. It is a certain sort of person, very caring person, and they feel like they have to be very um, organised and have a plan and have all sorts of solutions in place. And, and I've I've run a, a series of um, like adaptive canoeing and kayaking programs for qualified coaches for the British for British canoeing, and. The thing is, the thing I say to you, don't have a plan. Just say to the person, show me what you can do. Exactly that. That's how everybody should start with coaching of any disabled sport. Just like, let's figure out what you can do and then we'll figure out what we need to do. <laughs> well, and, and it's really interesting because if you take that approach and put that into able-bodied sport and just say, show me what you can do as well, it's, it's freaky about how much people can do and how little instruction and coaching they need. Yeah, it's it's a really cool approach, and I like I use it with all my other coaching, not just sailing coaching, like leadership coaches. It's better for you to show me what you can do rather than me just assume what you can do, because then you know we're going to be on the back foot from the start. So yeah, it's a much better approach. <laughs> so how do we go about changing that paradigm of what people think about adaptive sport and just just take the adaptive bit out and call it sport, like? <laughs> What 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 are uh, the sort of things do do you think people need to be aware of or think about um, uh, to to start making that move? People need to um, be aware of how judgmental they are. Like, if you're going to work with some form of disability sport, you're going to see people who are disabled. That's pretty much a given, right? So. Let's not just watch them get out of the car and assume that, you know, oh God, they're missing a leg or they're in a wheelchair or whatever it is. Or look, they're a bit limpy. Like, so therefore they can't do the following things. Why don't we wait and then figure out <laughs> what they can do? Like, let's give people a chance. Like, let's not judge people just on our first look, our first impression, because it's, it's often completely wrong. Hmm. And maybe some patience as well. Like the, the whole approach we just spoke about, about show, show me what you can do. That's, yeah. It, it's for the coach. It's not for the, not for the person being coached, but for the coach, it's, it feels like quite a slow progression. It's not like bang, 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 do this, 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 because whoever it is you've said that to is figuring out the, the new world at the same speed as the coaches really. And so yeah so so it might just take a little while longer but ultimately i think there's a huge amount of benefit of that yeah i think it, it definitely strengthens the relationship as a coach and an athlete if you can start on that level because you're working in partnership rather than a 
it's not a dictatorship with a coach it's like you do this you do this and you'll get better I, I don't believe that's how coaching works I think you need to have that relationship with the athlete and you need to understand them and that's that first step of actually understanding what they can do is is the most important one 100 <laughs> percent so you're off you're off to the Olymp- your first olympics tell me about your first olympics <laughs> oh my god um overwhelming completely bonkers like you don't know what is happening yeah you turn up and you know you've got this track suit on which is awful because it's got like a giant lion on the back and it says great britain and you're just like i don't know what i'm doing i've forgotten how to sail i've forgotten how to be a human <laughs> there's the mcdonald's there's coca-cola everywhere like there's so much going on you just yeah it's it's unreal for your first experience of the games like i remember being told before we went to athens like treat it like a normal world championship like yeah nice try because it's just anything but a normal championship i mean like what championship do you go to where you're being driven everywhere you can't go anywhere without security you're wearing this ridiculous tracksuit that's like awful um, someone's giving you free mcdonald's every few minutes like <laughs> what? that's not normal <laughs> it's not normal at all is it <laughs> no definitely not normal so how did you settle yourself in and go and actually race eventually was what, what did you have to do to go help you help yourself <laughs> Um, I think like yeah once we realized that it was a circus like there's a whole circus going on around you and you can accept that and then get into your bubble and just realize it's you and your boat and your teammates and your coach it's just like oh now I feel a bit better I feel a bit more protected like let's just remove all the noise and let's go and do what we need to do. It's very hard I've I've said to a a few Olympians before they went to the Olympics I've said, like, ignore, ignore the Olympics. Just ignore the Olympics. It's just you and your sport. Yeah. Don't socialize. Don't go look at anything. Don't go support anything. No. Put yourself in a bubble. And when you, when you finished, wherever, whatever, whatever you've achieved, when you finish that and you've achieved something, then go and engage with the rest of the Olympics. But whatever you do, don't do it beforehand because it's the, it's the world's largest overwhelm. Yeah, for sure. It definitely is. And it's a, a very big lesson to learn and you need to learn it before you get to the games and are you going to tokyo or uh is that on the cards uh tokyo is not but the next one might be i don't know yet <laughs> so you could end up to, so i'm just piecing the bits together vondi globe 2024 but i'm pretty sure the next olympics is in 2024 yeah there's enough time between the two so <laughs> I'm going to see if, if it's possible. I don't know yet. I, I, I like to be busy and I like to be full on charging for campaigns and I like to get stuff done. So, yeah, we'll see. Never say never. <laughs> so you could end up with like eight weeks between coming back from the Olympics and then jumping in your boat and disappearing off on the Vondi Globe. Yeah. Well, I, I guess that stops you thinking about it yeah for sure like and yeah it it's uh, a great thing for my team to be a part of because you know i have to basically hand over control and be like right guys i'm gonna go do this <laughs> you guys need to do this <laughs> i'll meet you in a few weeks <laughs> That's, wow cool so how do you make <laughs> how are you making that transition from short course small boat ish to like deep ocean offshore big ass boat and and also <laughs> also like team to solo i suppose as well is another um another big transition to make yeah it's been um it's been an interesting couple of years of learning for me so like i came back from rio and i knew obviously that this was the plan and i knew what i wanted so I basically started at the beginning. I was like, right, what do I need? I need qualifications. I need to be able to sail these boats. They're really different to what I've sailed. I knew I could sail, but can I use an engine? Can I (laughs) use all the electronics required, et cetera? So I basically just started from scratch and went, right, I'm going to do my competent crew and do my day skipper certificates. And I'm going to work my way up to Yacht Master and I'm just going to do step by step and just take it as it comes. Take every opportunity to get out sailing on the bigger boats and see what I can do, basically. So, yeah, that's <laughs> that's been my journey so far. And I'm, 
has it helped your short course sailing uh i think yeah i think it has because um i'm definitely a more qualified sailor i'm definitely um more respectful of the sea now i think and it's it's definitely given me the opportunity to go and race on larger boats on short courses which has been has been great and really good fun for me um and something i love doing so yeah i'll always go back and do short course racing but yeah the offshore stuff definitely still the aim <laughs> What are you looking forward to with the offshore stuff? Because you've got the round the island, you've got Vondi. What's the, what are you looking forward to? Um, or is it just pain and suffering to see how fast you can go? Um, the thing with offshore sailing is like at the time, whenever you're out, like you just spend your whole time going, why did I think this was a good idea? This is a terrible idea. I, I'm wet, I'm cold, I'm tired. I've got no one to talk to. I'm sick. I don't, I don't want to be here. And you spend your whole, your whole journey going, this is just awful. This is horrible. Why would I do this? But then you get ashore and you like, you, you almost become bipolar. Like I remember getting back from around Britain and Ireland and like the support crew getting on the boat to the park. And I'm just, I remember saying to Alex, my manager, just like, I'm never going to sailing again. I hate sailing. This is the worst idea. No, nope, never again. But then the next day to be found on the boat at 10 a.m. going, it's brilliant. It's amazing. <laughs> I love sailing. And I'm just like, oh, it's in a bit of an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, it's, it's a lot of pain and suffering, but you don't remember the pain and suffering when you come back. You, you remember the really good stuff like cruising through the night, like pitch black with just moonlight, dolphins doing epic speeds, getting water hosed <laughs> for hours on end. And just remembering that feeling and you're like it's amazing like it doesn't matter that i was throwing up 57 times off the back of the boat or i didn't eat for four days <laughs> whatever it was you don't remember that stuff <laughs> it sounds a bit like what, what my wife tells me childbirth is like is like it, it it sucks at the time but a couple of years later you're like oh wow there i think, I think we should have another one i'm like you told me that it's <laughs> never again <laughs> yeah i think that's pretty much it it's, it's a bit of a yeah why am i doing this oh my god it's amazing yeah <laughs> how do you see you're on the boat on your own you're disappearing off you said the the uh the britain on island so around you're obviously somebody needs well in theory somebody needs to be on watch 24 hours a day um in theory uh it's physically impossible for you to be safe and be awake for 24 hours a day so how do you manage that like what, what's the what's the process so yeah, I mean, technically all solo sailors break uh, the rule of someone being alert and awake and on watch all the time because yeah, you're right. You just physically, it, it's not possible to be awake for that length of time and function as a human being because you, you turn into a lunatic. I know because I've hallucinated things like goats in the middle of the ocean and it's just, <laughs> it's just weird, but like, you have to be really on top of your your wellness you have to look after yourself and I've learned the hard way a good few times that you have to sleep when you can so you take your 20 minute naps whenever you can get them even if it's 10 minutes it doesn't matter close your eyes get some sleep you have to eat you have to keep eating because I'm the worst I forget half the time I'm like oh when did I last eat and it's like oh that was like yesterday oh right I should probably put something in my body right now and yeah just looking after yourself like take your wet kit off even if you're absolutely dog tired and you just want to pass out face first on whatever's in front of you like it's just being careful and looking after yourself and managing it and yeah having a checklist of things like is the boat okay am i gonna hit anything am i gonna hit like land am i gonna kill myself like all these things and then right now i need to look after me so am i dry <laughs> am i have i eaten something when did i last drink something it's like having this checklist on the boat that makes you aware of everything and all of that while you're in a a, a sailing missile hurtling <laughs> along at what are you doing 12 knots 15 knots 30 knots how fast are you going <laughs> I mean, it depends on the on oh, the conditions, but yeah. yeah, like a lot of the time, it's it's basically like being in a washing machine. Like it's so noisy, it's loud, it's obnoxious, it's not stationary, obviously, and it's like trying to make tea while someone's throwing stuff at you and bouncing up and down, and just, yeah, it's not pleasant. <laughs> what is yeah? And I, so I suppose you're. <laughs> 
I'm just blowing my mind. But and I, then, how do you? Uh, I've got all sorts of questions. So you're on your own. The boat's hurtling along. There's waves crashing all over the place, and you want to put something warm, food-wise, inside you, or drink-wise, inside you. It's like, is that a non-starter? Or, and then, and then I'm quite lucky because I've got two hands, so I can like hold a pan yeah. into something at the same time without being thrown around. How do you? How do you do it? <laughs> It is, um, it's an art form, shall we say, and I have burnt myself on a few occasions because we use like the jet foil for like mm. a camping stove, but it's on a gimbal, so it does, you know, rattle around obviously with the boat. Um, but even so, if, when you're trying to pour boiling water into a bag with your rehydrated food in it, it it's a <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's not the easiest thing to do. And there are times when you're just like, this just is not going to happen without me, you know, third degree burns and it's not going to be good. So, yeah, there's times when you just have to find another energy source, be it snacks or whatever. So Yeah, I've, I've got friends who sailed the Pacific and sailed the, the Atlantic. In fact, actually, some of my friends have... Uh, I've got a, a friend who's rowed across the Atlantic. I've got a friend who's kayaked yeah. across the Atlantic. They've done all sorts of crazy things. And they they often say that eating and cooking and food is more dangerous than the sailing or anything else they're likely to do because you know you're you're juggling a cup of a scalding cup of tea whilst waves are coming over the front of the boat and ah yeah it's so not only boiling water but also fire on a boat which is like you know i'm pretty certain that's one of the first things we learned like fire on boat bad right yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Wow. So what, what do you do to help yourself prepare to be on your own with limited contact with other people for, well, I mean, the Vondi is going to be, how long's the Vondi? 50 days, something like that? Was that, what's the? Uh, the, the record at the moment is 74 days. So. 74. So you're going to be, yeah, let's just say 73 for you then. I've got every faith. <laughs> um, what, what is, what, what do you think, how do you prepare yourself to be that isolated for that long? you just go and do longer and longer on your own and you build up and eventually you get, uh, I'd say comfortable, but it's probably not the right word. You get used to (laughs) being isolated. You get used to your own company, but you know, you're not, you're never really alone offshore. That's like the bizarre thing with the comms we have these days, the trackers, the, the sat comms, you, you know, you're downloading weather information. You can get emails, you can get in contact with people. You've got a sat phone. So it's kind of like you're not you're not ever alone and we're like we're very good with my team that we have a set schedule whenever I'm off that um the team ring the boat at midday. Um like they know to ring the boat at midday and if I don't answer there's a protocol in place for that. And yeah. yeah, it's it's an interesting so it's kind of like you look forward to your midday chat with someone like a real human on the <laughs> other end of the line. You can go put put your imaginary friend to one side for a couple of for a for a, a brief period of time. Exactly, yeah, yeah. You have to remember to like get dressed and stuff, and just like actually be a human being because you know when you're on your own, there's no judgment, is there? You can do what you want. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Naked, <laughs> naked or whatever you please. Um, go for your exactly. life. Who's watching? <laughs> exactly. watching? Who's <laughs> watching? It's, and I guess it's the, the most challenging bit is, is so you're on your own, but I suppose when the, do- when the sun is shining, the boat's whistling along, the dolphins are bouncing, it, that's, that's not the, really the hard bit. It's the three o'clock in the morning, your sail's just ripped. <laughs> yeah, and stuff's gone really wrong. <laughs> yeah. Like, what, yeah. what, do you, what do you do to put in place to, like, manage that stuff? Is it huge amounts of experience, fixed operating protocols? I don't know. What happens? <laughs> uh, trial and error has been a really good learning one for me, like, just going and doing and having things go wrong. And, you know, you you learn how you react in the really stressful situations. We've done the stress exposure training, so I know how I handle that level of stress and yeah it's been it's actually been kind of fun because I've I've learned a lot about myself and how I react and what I need to then refocus and get a situation dealt with whatever it whatever the situation may be but yeah we have a lot of planning that goes into it so we have like a what if scenario plan we know 
you know, you learn your boat inside and out. You learn all of the, the quirks. You know how to fix stuff. You learn how to fix stuff. If you can't fix it, you get on the phone and you find someone who can fix it. Like, it's just, um, yeah, it's good. It's a good learning experience. <laughs> Well, it's incredible. It's incredible. And, and your route for the Vendee, and I want to come back to the Olympics in a second, but your route for the Vendee is a little bit different to those cruising sailors who are going to sail around the world. You know, amble through the, uh, through the Panama Canal and then wander across the Pacific to the Marquesas or somewhere or, you know, French yeah. Polynesia. And <laughs> Sounds <all> lovely. <laughs> it, it does, it, you should try it one day. <laughs> Maybe, nah. <laughs> well, I, actually, there's a curious question is, is, are you always going to be a competitive sailor or do you think you could go and do like the exploration side of stuff? Uh, I'm a nightmare. Um, so I, uh, I work with a, a sailing school locally on the Isle of Wight and yeah, she, the, the lead instructor at the school only brings me in for the racy stuff now because I, I just can't do cruising. I'm not, I, I'm like, oh, let's push the boat. We can go slightly faster here. And, and, you know, they're like, we're just here for a cruise to France. We just want to, you know, go across the channel. And I'm like, we could go faster across the channel. So, yeah, I, I just do the racing kind of stuff because I'm not patient enough for cruising. Well, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? Because something like the Vondi or anything offshore, it, you do need to know when you've pushed far enough because there's a very very fine line in anything in the outdoors between going like balls to the wall as fast as possible in the recognition though that you've got like 70 plus days to keep doing it and when you go that fast that hard big things break quite spectacularly yeah it's one of the first things um sir robin Knox johnson said to me so he's one of my mentors and he said you have to live to race another day so and it, it's a been a big a big message and actually a big part of all my sort of offshore racing is that we have to keep the boat together because the boat keeps us alive and then we race so we keep everything safe and we, we race on top of it so it's always it's always been safety first with me i you know I'm a fanatic when it comes to it and my team often are frustrated <laughs> with me because I'm like what that's the limit <laughs> but the thing is i've tested that limit and i know where that limit is so when i'm saying yeah we need to rein it in a bit there's probably a good reason as in i haven't reined it in and it, it went wrong last time <laughs> <laughs> yeah last time i did it it didn't go so well so we better <laughs> stop now <That's> yeah. <laughs> how do you balance preparing for the sort of offshore longer form of sailing racing in bigger boats with uh, the demands of world champion sailing, Paralympic sailing, short course, because they're very similar. And yet, as with all sports, they're very different and require different things from you at different times. How do you do the ballot, the juggling act? It's, uh, it's been interesting because obviously, like, if you go and you train for any period offshore, you come back and you're completely ruined and unable to function as a human <laughs> for like a couple of days. So, we have to be really careful with mapping out any training blocks so that I know I'm not, you know, basically going to go from one to the other. So I don't come back from a big offshore race and then just jump straight <laughs> into some kind of short course racing where you definitely need to be awake and alert and alive. So yeah, we're, we're really good at like mapping it all out. So it fits together and, and prioritizing different bits at the right time. Wow. And how do you fund it all? I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you all the big <laughs> questions. Because, well, no, 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 but like, okay, so I, I'll, uh, as a person who wants to sail around the world, uh, and I have the relevant badges to go sail around the world, that's not a problem. My, my, pro my stumbling block is, is the quantity of cash required to buy, buy a boat to sail around the world. Um, how do you make all that work? You, you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the hardest bit is, is funding the campaign. And, you know, I have full-time jobs. I work as well to fund this and I work with sponsors. Um, so at the moment I'm desperately fundraising towards being able to buy my own boat because I charter at the moment. So I use a French boat and uh, not being rude to them. It's just a hard, hard slog. Whenever we charter this boat, it's a nightmare. <laughs> it's just, 
like being able to have your own boat is like the next stepping step for me to be comfortable offshore because I know whenever I take this poor little boat out like something's gonna go wrong because that's just what it does to me so <laughs> yeah having my own boat is like the step this year where we're, we're fundraising towards that so yeah it's, it's difficult you know I have to work I have to fund my sailing habit so it's it's a tough slog it's a tough slog. So if, if you were to have an ideal sponsor, because I, I know you're short of a sponsor or two, um, and who knows who will end up watching this? Who's, who's the ideal sponsor? So the ideal sponsor for me is someone that's in the campaign for the same reason that I am. So I'm not in, as, as weird as this sounds, even to myself saying this, I'm not in the Vendee campaign to come out on top like I'm not in it for that the whole reason I started this journey and I wanted to campaign is to show people what's possible like I've believed all my life that anything is possible with self-belief and yeah, I struggle with it at times but I do have that in myself I know I can do this and I want to show other people that they can do things as well so it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be something as mental as going and doing the Sunday Globe, but it is possible if you believe it's possible. And that's the thing I want. I want someone to come on board with my campaign and think, actually, yeah, it is possible. And we believe it's possible. And now our employees believe it's possible and our clients believe it's possible. So yeah, I want to share kind of this journey with, with people that believe that. So it's like breaking the paradigm about like, there's there's a line there's a line in the sand that people hit and then bounce back and actually we can delete the line in the sand yeah it's it's time it's gone because like you know even starting on this campaign and going and like getting my yacht master ticket like i got refused at a sailing school because of my disability and it's like it's it's 2020 guys come on it's time that we we stop this like let's let's not judge let's let's see what's possible and let's believe in things being possible so yeah if that if there's one thing that comes out of me doing this that's what i want yeah it's taking that um yeah it almost goes back to the show me what you can do um yeah as opposed to the 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 what the assumption of what somebody can do um wow so in 2020 somebody wouldn't let you go to a sailing school to do the yacht master <laughs> It was twenty. It was twenty seventeen. But yeah, he Still. basically took a look at me. Yeah, and he was like, "You, how would you hold on to the boat?" And I was like, "I mean, do you even know me? Like, I've been sailing my whole life, and I've not yet fallen off one. So, like, I mean, and if I do, we'll deal with it. Like, that's kind of the point of a yacht master is that you can cope with these situations. Like, and yeah, he just he wouldn't teach me, and I couldn't do my yacht master ticket with them. So I. I did. I lucky. I did find a school that was cool with me doing it and really understanding. And actually, that guy laughed out. You know, I I proved a lot of people wrong with the yacht master thing. So. Yeah. Well, I, I anything's possible. <laughs> what What's your advice though? Though, so there's there's lots of people who are going to be watching this. Maybe they're uh, parents or relations of somebody who's not got a fully able child, or maybe maybe they're not fully able themselves and they've got a desire, but they kind of like can't get themselves to go and realize it. What, what's your message to those people? Go and do it. Just go and do it anyway. Like just before I went to take my yacht master exam, I was having a really tough time with people just not believing that it was possible. And I almost considered not taking my exam. Like I was like, Oh, I'm just not in a good space. Like no one thinks I can do this. So, you know, why am I going to go through a week of suffering with some examiner to prove I can, you know, why am I going to do this? And then I got this message from Australia and it was from a girl in a wheelchair and she was wearing one of my t-shirts. Like she'd got a Hannah Stoker racing t-shirt on and she was like, I'm going sailing today. And like that kind of just did it for me. I was like, what? And she, it turned out she chosen to go sailing because she'd been following me on instagram she'd picked up the message that was like just go and try it just believe in yourself just do it and she got herself out of her house she put my t-shirt on and she was off on sydney harbour for a yacht and it was like that's it that's the message just go and do it if you think you can cool that's it that's all that you need just do it yeah and even if you're curious whether you can or you can't go do it anyway 
Exactly. Go, what's the worst that's going to happen? I mean, I mean, with sailing, you're going to get wet. That's <laughs> like, it. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty much it. You know, there's a lot of schools out there that will try and teach any ability. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of adaptive boats out there. It doesn't matter what your disability is. It doesn't matter. Go and try. And it's the same with all sports. You know, I went to go ape and they didn't think that was possible because of the, you needed two hands to clip the flipping thing on. And then they were like, wait a second. And they found a one handed one. And it's like, right, there we go. Just think outside the box and give it a try. What's the worst that's going to happen? Yeah, you could get, and let's be honest about it. With sailing, you're going to get wet either way. So it doesn't really matter. Exactly. You'll enjoy it either way. So. <laughs> That's it. So with, with all of your pushing the boat and trying to get it to go faster, have you had a moment where you've just pushed it a little bit too far? Oh, God, yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, like, yeah, a couple, like one of my first training runs we did from um, Norway back to Southampton. And I remember the guy I was sailing with, really experienced guy. And he was like, I'm just going to let you like make the calls and make the decisions and we'll you know we'll we'll go from there and I remember I'd looked at the weather I'd been really like clever I'd gone through all the computer stuff and like yeah, no, we're good we're good we're good and he I could see him like over my shoulder like checking kind of thing and like long story short I'd made a really bad call I'd used completely the wrong weather hadn't even checked I was on the right day had made an absolutely idiotic decision <laughs> to keep way too much sail up in the air and yeah, got woken up at 2 a.m. by this poor guy who was like, yeah, bad call. Shall we deal with this? <laughs> like, okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's been a few of those moments where you can just see like a coach <laughs> going, oh my God, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I've kayaked around the UK and when I was going across the north of Scotland, we were in Expedition Sea Kayaks. Um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. You come out of, um, oh my goodness me, my brain's got de dead. It's on the top northeast corner of Scotland. Um, oh, anyway, Thurso area. And there's okay. um, the, the tides whistle through like in between like the Shetland Isles and mainland Scotland. And they, the, it goes flying through there. I mean, with, <laughs> like, yes, the, the Navy, yeah, the Navy like, has special yeah. permission to go through there on occasions. It can be that epic. And um, I I'd, I'd left the, the tidal work that day to a friend of mine who was absolutely exhausted. And he just like, oh, yeah, I'll do it. As so we paddle out of, I think it's called Scrabster, actually, I think is the place by Thurso there. We paddle out of there and we get out into the tide race. And as we're turning east, there's supposed to be a ginormous, great green, um, green boy there, like a massive one, like one of the ones that's the size of a van, you know, that size. Yeah. It's eerie as we get out there and we get out there and I'm like, where is this damn thing? The charts in front of me that says it's here. Anyway, and Roger looks down and he'd messed up the tidal planning and the, the boy is underneath the flow, like bobbing up and down, like, <laughs> Like, uh, but remaining under the water, but like coming, coming up and then going. Oh back. my like, god! You can just about see the green, and uh, I think it's called the Merry Men of May, is what one of the races there is called, and it's a it's a tidal step in the main flow. So it goes, drops a meter, and then carries on going. And afterwards, oh. is all of these ginormous waves. Um, <laughs> and it was one of those moments where I I saw this thing going down and up and i thought well we can't go back because it was doing about 20 knots so we're not going to go back against that and, and i looked i looked ahead and i thought I, I really hope that isn't as big as it looks from here and uh, yeah it was yes i had my butt cheeks very tightly clenched together for quite a while <laughs> oh my God. yeah scotland yeah some fun times i've got actual video of me like we'd rounded muckle plugger like right at the top and come yep. out and i'm just like scotland can do one like <laughs> don't like scotland anymore <laughs> sorry to scotland but i'd had a bad time rounding you <laughs> yeah but if, if, yeah. if you want to tell people people are like how do i go and perfect all my tidal work and my planning and <laughs> Like weather and peace, all the bits Scotland. like uh, Scotland every single time. <laughs> yeah, Scotland. Stuff that you can do so easily in Scotland. 
It's horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> it's no fun at all. Oh, it's really not like we we went round with like a horrendous storm and it was like 50 plus knots and it was just like a day and a half of just pure suffering and it's just like you get to the north sea and it's like just go away scotland i'm just done with you just like just go no and it's not over when you get to the north sea either is it you get to the north sea and the north sea can be sporty if it wants to be uh it can be yeah that was where i made my first mistake uh yeah it wasn't actually the time we came back from scotland it was flat calm and i've never seen the north sea like that we floated for like a day doing nothing because it was just like we watched a movie at one point (laughs) (laughs) we set off for cinema on the boat because it's like i mean i'll go nowhere because there's no wind so (laughs) (laughs) be the last the last time that the north sea is ever that calm for me i suspect (laughs) i find the north sea a very spooky Uh, spooky is that the right word yeah very spooky it's like i don't know it's hard to describe it's all the when you start seeing all the oil rigs and the platforms and like there's a lot of traffic and just random wind farms just come out and you're like where does that come from (laughs) well that's it but also when you think about sailing or anything on the sea you you think about the iconic really scary things that everybody talks about and People don't talk about the North Sea that much in comparison to everything else. And yet the North Sea has frankly been some of the scariest sailing and kayaking I've ever done in my life. Yeah, yes, it can be pretty sketchy. Maybe it's the place, you know, when you, you, you've obviously got the Southern Atlantic to do, to do go, go and have a go at when you go with the Vendee. Um, maybe the North Sea is the logical best training ground of go and scare yourself for a while and see what happens. Yeah, it definitely has its uh, its reputation for being fresh to fruity. <laughs> fresh to fruity, I've never heard that. <laughs> or fresh to frightening, depending on <laughs> what level you're at. <laughs> so, so you're you're off sailing. How do you have you yet built for yourself, or I do you know when it is you're about to go and push the boat too hard, like some indicators that this like. Yes, we could go and take that reef out and, and push a little bit faster, but really, that would be a really daft move. Uh, no, normally you've done it, and then you're like, "Yeah, that was dumb." <laughs> <laughs> like, just like you just you just you look at the weather and you're like, it's "Just on the edge," and like, "Oh, we could. Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it." Oh no, no, that was that was stupid. And then you know you're stupid and then you have to spend like however long knowing that you're stupid because you can't fix the situation. So yeah, there's a few of those moments. Yeah, because yeah. we try to ban. <laughs> I was going to say, like, if, you're, if you're cruising, you can always turn up into wind and start, well, not always, but you can try and turn up into wind and drop some sail. If you're racing, that's yeah. a whole different story. Or like pull in somewhere and, you know, go and have a warm shower and go for dinner somewhere nice. But yeah, we don't get that option, sadly. <laughs> yeah, I, I liked your comment because um, uh, you, 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 you corrected my naivety about the Vlondie before we, before we started recording this. And I'm like, you get to stop anywhere. And you're like, you said, only if it goes horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. Like, if you're not where you're supposed to be, like you've stopped somewhere, then yeah, it's gone bad. <laughs> gone bad. How do you manage horribly wrong in the South Atlantic? I mean, uh, uh, international rescue is uh, is, is <laughs> yeah. not exactly close at hand. What 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 do you do to manage all that? You just have to be careful and plan and have faith and trust in your boat that it's going to stay together, and you look after it, and you you learn very quickly when to push and when not to. Do. Um, yeah, and you just you realise that the Atlantic is the starting point for your round the world trip. So if you can't keep your boat together there, then you probably don't want to be turning left at the bottom anyway because you, it gets nasty down there. So <laughs> you don't want to be pushing too hard too soon, kind of thing. And then I suppose when you when you turn left at the bottom, you end up with a whole like, could you run into icebergs or what? How far south are you actually going? Uh, the, well, the Vonday organisers are very careful with where they put the gates so that you can't go too far south now, um, obviously to avoid that risk, but that, that doesn't mean to say that you won't see them. 
but obviously you do try to avoid them like anything because that's not a fun sight that you want to be seeing off your bow like oh my god you know that didn't end well for the titanic did it so no i was just about to say <laughs> you, don't, you don't want your own uh, uh leonardo dicaprio mo Capri of course his name leonardo dicaprio you don't want that moment on the yeah. front of your own boat no you don't want to be arguing over a door so <laughs> And what about shipping containers? Because I, I heard some stupid statistic the other day of like how many lost shipping containers there are in the world that have just fallen off a boat and evaporated. Is that a real problem or is it not or what? Yeah, I mean, underwater objects are like the bane of life because the chance of you hitting one is pretty, is pretty up there. And yeah, I mean, I've hit stuff in the night and it's it's genuinely terrifying like the the feeling the noise the oh my god what has just happened you know like kicking into survival mode straight away like I was lucky it wasn't an it we didn't have a situation where we were you know in danger but yeah it could have been a lot worse and it has gone a lot worse for people hitting pretty large items so yeah it's, it's a real a genuine concern for anybody that does race offshore is hitting hitting stuff underwater and I guess you don't know what you've hit till you've hit it. And even then you might not know. You just know what the outcome is. Yeah. And generally that's total boat loss or, or worse. So. Yeah. And so in your boat, when you do the Vendee, <laughs> will you have like a, a sealed bulkhead a third of the way through the front of the boat? So if you take a front impact, it's, I don't, I'm completely naive. So I'm asking the world's stupidest questions probably, but. No. Do you have. Yeah. I mean, the boats place? have yeah they have crash tanks and things and they can they can float up to a certain point um before you lose them but yeah it's um it's difficult <laughs> you have um scavenger pumps and things to try and keep it afloat and you obviously do your best to keep your boat afloat but you know if, if you've ripped a large chunk out the you're pretty much on a exit stage left kind of territory <laughs> exit stage left <laughs> jeepers well, that's all the doom and gloom stuff out of the way, I reckon. How cool is that? Um, yeah. Awesome. So I, I told you about this when we first spoke before we hit record, but I want to give you the chance to have a little rant, to get something off your chest about anything you like in the world. Now, it could be obvious and sailing related, or we have had a professional whitewater kayaker rant about veganism, even though he's a vegan. Um, <laughs> go, go bigger. <laughs> Um, his, his, uh, his message was something along, he went for about 10 minutes, but his message was some of the, something along the lines of cool, be a vegan, but you don't have to shout about it. Um, but for 10 minutes. So, uh, so Hannah, I want to hand over the mic to you for your chance to rant about anything of your choice for as long as you like. What, what do you want to <laughs> rant about? I, well, we've already kind of touched on it. So I want to rant about judgment and people judging. Stop judging. <laughs> Stop taking a look at people and judging them because god damn it <laughs> like I am fed up with being judged like I turn up and I've got one arm and oh my god how could I possibly say or, or how could I do anything I've had people try to carry my luggage like I'm a grown woman I can carry my luggage <laughs> like, I've packed that much crap I'll carry that much <laughs> crap you know but Jesus like <laughs> I hate being judged. And then you get like the opposite end of the spectrum. Like if I park in a blue badge bay, stop running up to me, old people, and shouting at me for being in a disabled bay. I'm a disabled person. <laughs> I'm allowed to park in the bay. <laughs> like, like, go and shout at the person that's got a blue badge because they're fat. Like, come on. Like, that's not a real disability. Like, <laughs> stop judging people. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yes, I'm disabled, but I'm capable. Let's calm down about it, okay? And uh, just stop it. Just, just stop judging people. Like, let's let's see what people can do before we make that assumption. Like, by all means, help me carry my bag, <laughs> like, but don't assume that I can't carry it because you know I probably made it this far and I've dressed myself in the morning, so you know we're cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All my clothes are on the right way, facing forwards. Everything's in the right place. I can probably do the rest. <laughs> Yeah, I had it at, like, I went to Universal in Florida, like, a couple of years ago, and I was with my sister, and we got pulled out of a queue, and I was like, oh my god, what have we done, like, we, we've done something, like, we in trouble, 
kind of thing. And it was, they pulled me out because I couldn't queue because I was disabled. I was like, I mean, my legs work. <laughs> Why do I now, I mean, you know, obviously I'm grateful because I'm not queuing anymore, <laughs> but seriously? <laughs> I, I was just about to say, there's got to be an upside. And if skipping the whole queue is the upside, like I suppose yeah. you'd, you'd be crazy not to take it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> cool. So judging people, please stop judging. That's great. Yeah, and especially with disability sport. Like let's, let's, let's just stop that immediately. Like. And, and women in sport. We get it with sailing loads, like, oh, bless your heart, you've got a woman. Like, and I've had it, I've pulled up to a, full, a fuel pontoon and been asked where the skipper was. And I was like, I mean, you see me driving this boat, yeah? Like, I mean, just me, yeah? <laughs> like, where's your man? I mean, really? <laughs> oh, my Let's just not me. do that. Let's just stop it. <laughs> are, we, are we really in 2020? I mean, is that is that really a thing we're actually here? I, yeah, I did wonder that. Like, I race on an all boys boat, and, like, and I drive, and I'm allowed to drive. Like, I'm a girl, and like, there's loads of banter, and that's cool. But let's stop the oh my god, there's a woman driving your boat judgment. <laughs> like, let's stop that. It's crazy as well because in I can see in some sports how there is a, a physiological difference in the sport that changes like timings and strength and things like that. But on the flip side of the coin, um, you know, if, if Roger Federer was to play uh, oh, one of the uh, Serena Williams, there's, yeah. there's, there's, there is going to be a physiological difference between the two where there'll be a different outcome at the end. But sailing's one of the beautiful sports where it's, like 50% intellect and 50% physical ability. And, and actually the intellect can compensate for so much physical ability because it, it, it's all, it is really a gender neutral sport. Um, and and I, I just, I, I think people should get out of their own way and get, get out of other people's way. Yeah. And stop assuming stuff. Like, I'm a big girl. Like I'm a big girl. Like I'm strong. I was made this way. Like I'm heavier than half of the guys on the boat anyway. So just you get out the way. I'm fine. Like let's not panic just because I've got boobs. You know it's fine. I got this. <laughs> I love that. Just because I've got boobs, stop judging me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm fine. It's cool. Wow. Wow. Well, Hannah, I just want to say thank you for being an inspiration to the world. Um, we, in my opinion, we need more Hannahs who are going to go out there and say, there's a paradigm in place, but excuse my language, fuck the paradigm. I'm going to go and explode it and show you what's really possible. And without people like you going and taking what people think is normal or like judgments they make, um, the world will be a significantly worse place. So I, I want to thank you for giving others the opportunity to believe that there can be uh, I was a new normal, but I don't mean that in the COVID way. I mean that like yeah. a new normal in terms of what we can all achieve. Um, and, and that goes not just for somebody who might be not fully able-bodied, but equally to the rest of us who like are fully able-bodied, stop whining, get out there, go do it. Otherwise a Paralympic sailor chick's going to prove you all wrong. So thank you very much. No worries at all. So if, if people want to come and follow your journey, hang out with you, sponsor you, please find somebody to sponsor Hannah and get her her boat so she can go and kick ass around the world um, or, or whatever else is. How's, where's the best place for them to come and find you, join you, follow you, support you? What do they need to do? Uh, so, well, the official um, website is hannahstodalracing.com, um, but I do have my very personal uh, experience sharing over on my blog, which is Sailing Hannah. Um, all my social media is Sailing Hannah, so it's super easy to find me. Um, I will probably just throw a little warning. Like, I'm brutally honest. I share everything, you know, the good days, the bad days, pictures of my dog. <laughs> like, you're going to get everything with me, and that's that's kind of what I love about my social media is that I don't hide anything. You know, if, if I'm having a crap day, I'm going to tell you I'm having a crap day. So. Awesome. Well, I think social media needs, <laughs> needs more of that and less of the, uh, I've borrowed a Ferrari and look how rich I'm pretending to be. Um, I definitely need more of that. I haven't got time to pose for that kind of picture and like edit myself. I just, just, you know, what you're going to get what was just what's there. So. <laughs>
<laughs> I, I came a cropper a little while ago. We had a uh, an outdoor influencer, female outdoor influencer in America, who's got the most amazing Instagram uh, pictures, mostly of her in tight shorts and a crop top, to be completely honest. Um, <laughs> and, and it turns out that, that none of those images have been worked for. They're all like drive, walk for 500 meters. Uh, it's in the snow, take off all my clothes, get a photo taken of me in the snow with a, with a crop top on, and then walk back to the warm car and drive somewhere else. Uh, and it's like, I can't have it. you on the podcast <laughs> because that's just, it's just not real. No, people want it, you know, I want to share the me covered in snot, having not slept for three days, like I vomed down my clothes, like this, that's what it's really like. <laughs> I mean, and that's what you're going to get, you know, like, I mean, my mum had to wash noodles out of my pocket of my smock, because it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the reality, like, you know, Instagram versus reality and all of that, like, let's just share reality, because that's what it's about, right? It's supposed to be sharing photos of what is actually real <laughs> yeah I don't, I don't think the world likes real it's too much pain and too much hard work um have you seen the effort that goes into posing for photos my god i can't get a good photo to save my life <laughs> i i know the feeling the, there must be an art form to holding your phone and getting it like in the right angle in the right way and so on and so forth the effort, and I'm like, I look through my photos and I'm like, I've got 15 chins, I've got like, yeah, I mean, it's just, I haven't got time to go and pose for this stuff. And like, <laughs> sorry to my sponsors who keep asking me for decent photos. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, we try. <laughs> I've, I've got a top tip for that. You just ask them to send you a photographer for half a day and then like you make that you make the photographer seasick on the boat for half a day and uh, they can get, they can do the best they can to get photos and then that's it done. For sure. Or you can destroy like several thousand pounds worth of camera by salt water. <laughs> I can tell you a very upsetting story about that. You know what a Peli case is, right? A Peli case is one of yeah. those. So I had a very fancy Canon camera with some very fancy Canon lenses offshore, off Scotland, off, I think we went out of Oban. We're, Scotland. Anyway, Scotland again, see? Scotland again. <laughs> and, um, and I was sailing this time and okay. it was pretty... Um, uh, I would just say it was sporty, crappy weather, shall we? That was just like, that's just to describe the sailing. You can kind of imagine Oban, sporty and crappy offshore. It's, it has moments of, oh, shit. Anyway, we had, <laughs> we had two days like that. And the Peli case had been in the cockpit, but like strapped down. But I, I wasn't worried about it because it's a Peli case, right? Those things are bomb proof. Um, anyway... After everything stopped being quite so sporty and stopped, sport, stopped so crappy, I thought, well, let's give it a, let's get some photos, shall we? And um, I went to the penny case and, and pulled it out. And um, the strap for the camera had got caught in the seal for the past three days. Oh my God. It had just, it had just like wicked water inside the penny case. And there's about, I don't know. 12,000 pounds worth of camera and lenses and just floating around in five centimeters of salt water and had been for several days. Wow. <laughs> yep. Yeah, salt water's not the one. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, they, they, people often say if you want to screw something up, just add salt water. So, um, yeah. <laughs> there you go. There yeah, you go. any electronics. <laughs> Wow, cool. Right, Hannah, I'm going to love you and leave you. Um, be epic. Go be incredible. And uh, just do us a favor and go and pop into the Week Outdoors tribe on Facebook if you get a chance. And uh, go, go and pop some images up there and inspire some people in the tribe to go sailing or at least support you in your journey going further. Would that be all right? Yeah, no worries at all. Cool.